Hello and welcome. Hmm. Okay, there we go. I'm sorry. I just opened a uh, drink, a little plastic ring. Anyway, yeah, as you can see, I've done went through one of the uh, cataract surgeries. So, anyway, my name is Alan, and we are back. More Massacre at El Mazote. This is supposed to be last week's stuff. I'm still doing. I don't care. Because. <laughs> screw it. You know, let's get them all done anyway. Because why, why not? Fuck it. Anyway. We're going to finish this chapter up here. It was not the most propitious time. Woo! Hard to read. It was not the most propitious time. The army was tense. Three days before guerrilla commandos had stormed um, Il Pongo in the daring raid and had succeeded in destroying a large part of Salvador's air force as it sat on the tarmac. The raid, which was a guerrilla, which the guerrillas named Operation Martyrs uh, uh, of Heroic Morazan, in honor of those killed in December, would not look good to Washington. The congressional debate loomed large in the minds of those in the United States Embassy. It was in the middle of the phenomenally packed intense period down there. Um, green Tree uh, recently told me by telephone. We had investigated the murders of the nuns. We had the constituent assembly elections coming up. And, of course, we had the certification, which only intensified the pressure from the political microscope in the states, as Green Tree called it. The primary policy objective at the time was to get the certification through, he said, and the spectacular reports of the massacre threatened the certification. From the embassy's point of view, the guerrillas were trying to make us look as bad as possible. They wanted to shut the whole thing down. The America, Americans landed at the Brigade Command in San Miguel to refuel and to receive their first briefing. The Brigade Commander was expecting us, Green Tree said. In San Miguel, that was Flores. Colonel Jaime... Ernesto Flores Grejalba, the overall commander of Operation Rescue. Also present, Green Tree believes he is not absolutely certain, was Domingo Montorosa, the officer 
officers gave the Americans a sort of after-action report saying which units were where, uh, Green Tree said. As I recall, the Atlacado was the main combat unit and they talked about the hammer and anvil nonsense. We were dismayed because the Atlacado was supposed to have been developed, supposed to have developed new tactics, but now they were back to the same old shit. You know, uh, insert a blocking, op blocking force and then carry out a sweep. The message about El Mazote, the version that the Salvadoran army had presumably already provided the defense attache office, was in effect that the army had fought hard to dislodge a large company of guerrillas from the town, even though perhaps a few civilians uh, had been killed in the crossfire. Soldiers certainly had not carried out a massacre. Colonel Flores was not particularly happy to see the Americans, and it was uh, clear from his attitude his attitude was shared by the other officers in the uh, they encountered that day. As McKay, who is now a colonel attached to NATO headquarters in Brussels and was given permission to speak publicly about the events at El Mazote by the Defense Department, told me, in general, as had they, uh, we had little uh, cooperation when we went to Morazan. They left San Miguel and flew over to Tirola toward El Mazote. You could now see there had been a combat sweep through the area, Green Tree said. You could tell El Mazote had been pretty much destroyed. Roofs were collapsed. Buildings were destroyed and the place was pretty much abandoned. As they flew over El Mazote, Green Tree went on. He could see signs of battle. There were escarpment close to the town. Uh, an obvious line of defense and you could see French or trench lines there. There were definitely fortifications in the vicinity. When I pressed him for details, he said that the fortifications might have been closer to Arambala, a mile or so away. They made several passes at a couple of hundred feet, then circled around for a better look. As we lost altitude and got within range, we got shot at, Green Tree said. That was pretty standard stuff out there. It was definitely not a landing situation. They headed out to Gotera touched down at the barracks and received another briefing. The purpose of the briefing was to impress on us that this was a war zone out there, said Bleak, uh, Bleakley, the deputy chief of mission who had come to Gotera on another helicopter and met Green Tree and McKay there. The officer's point was that not only were they not out there killing civilians, but they were fighting 
for their lives in that very dangerous war zone to protect the civilians from guerrilla atrocities. The Americans said they like to have a look, talk to some people in and around the town. It was extremely tense, McKay told me. The army was clearly not happy with our presence there. The colonel was obviously taking orders from someone else, and they gave us very little cooperation. Accompanied by a squad of soldiers, McKay, Greentree, and Bleakley set off for the refugee camp outside Gotera. We literally went up and down the street saying, Hey, do you know anyone from El Mazote? Bleakley said. The impression you got was that people, from people, was that this was a conflict zone. That the people still up there were camp followers, you know, involved in the conflict. And yet, as Green Tree and McKay acknowledged, the presence of the soldiers made a task of conducting what would, in any case, have been difficult interviews almost impossible. The refugees, in effect, were being asked to describe a conflict zone from which they had recently fled, a fact which, in the soldiers' eyes, automatically put the refugees under suspicion of being guerrilla sympathizers themselves. And to describe it uh, to what was, as far as they were concerned, nothing more than a group of soldiers. You had a bunch of very intimidated, scared people, and now the army presence further intimidated them, McKay said. I mean, the Atlacado had supposedly done something horrible, and now these gringos show up under the pretense of investigating it, but in the presence of these soldiers. It was probably the worst thing you could do. I mean... You didn't have to be a rocket scientist to know what the army people were there for. The three Americans agree that the information they gathered in the refugee camp was not explicit and this lack of direct confirmation would play a key part in what they later reported or rather, didn't report back to Washington. As Green Tree put it, it did not get any direct eyewitness accounts of what had taken place of the top that Ray Bonner and Alma Guillermo Prieto reported. Not that they expected people to speak so implicit, er, so explicitly. People sitting on uh, in a refugee camp. Um, Green Tree said, who have reassociated themselves in some way with the government who may have been guerrilla sympathizers were not going to sit there and give you an eyewitness blow-by-blow -blow description on what happened. It's just not possible to get that. It was more sort of the way people were talking and the way the kids around were still looking as if they'd been through hell. The people saying, yes, my wife was killed, that sort of thing. Green Tree did manage to speak with a number of people, including a mayor from one of the towns near El Mazote and several peasants who had lived near the hamlet out of the soldiers' hearing. Uh, McKay would work 
the military and keep them distracted while I went out and around and talked to people, Green Tree said. Sometime during these interviews, Green Tree remembers having conversations with more than a dozen people. He said McKay became convinced that something had happened in El Mazote. You could observe and feel the tremendous fear, said McKay. I was in Vietnam and I recognized the ambiance. The fear was overriding and we sensed it and we could tell that that fear was not distilled by the guerrillas. People were freaked out and pretty scared and talking and stuff, Green Tree said. But there was enough to give a pretty strong impression of the horrors of war that these people had suffered. The interviews in the refugee camp, he told me flatly, convinced me that there probably had been a massacre, that they had lined people up and shot them. Bleakley, however, who was a deputy chief of mission, was the senior officer of the three, told me that though it was clear people had been killed, some had some of them civilians, that we couldn't answer uh, that we couldn't answer was the fundamental question. You know, the difference between subduing a town and pulling out the civilians, my life style, and massacring them. Still, Green Tree said each person I talked to confirmed the impression that something bad happened, but nobody was willing to go ahead and give the exact story. He drew this conclusion from things they said, their general manner and their general unwillingness to talk, and that includes the soldiers as well. I mean, you talk to a soldier who thinks he's taken part in some heroic operation, and a Latin soldier, I mean, you can't get him to shut up. But these soldiers would say nothing. There was something there. Traveling with the squad of soldiers, McKay and Green Tree left the refugee camp. Bleakley, who had business in the camp, stayed at Gatera, climbed into a military jeep, and headed up the Black Road. We went to five villages, McKay said, including uh, Hoko or Hokwai Tike within a few miles of El Mozote. We talked to a priest who gave us oblique information that something horrible had happened and that it was committed by the army. Now the two men accompanied by the soldiers set out for El Mozote to see for themselves. Between five and seven clicks south of Hokaitike, we were going to turn on off the road toward the hamlet and head there cross country. McKay said, but the soldiers had begun to grow quiet. There began to be complaints. They were already sensitive about the civilian with me. Now they were getting more and more sullen. You know, they'd look at the ground, mumble something about being out of radio contact. 
Finally, the ground re uh, the group reached the place they'd have to leave the Black Road for El Mazote. At that point, the soldiers just stopped. The sergeant said, We're not going any farther. We're not going to help you. It was made very clear that we would get no more cooperation. They had come very close to El Mazote. In less than an hour, they could have seen for themselves the burned buildings, the ruined sacristy, and the bodies. But, with the soldiers' refusal to go on, the Americans faced the choice of heading on across open country, guerrilla, guerrilla controlled country, without protection or turning back. They want to know what made me decide, McKay said. Well, I'd been on that helicopter over there and we'd received fire. And the month before, the guerrillas had wiped out a whole company up there. What made me decide, me, the big tough Marine, I was scared shitless. The choice was clear. The Americans, with their soldier escort, turned around and trooped back to Gotera. And from there, the helicopter carried them back to the capital. The investigation was over. But yeah, that ends that particular chapter. So yeah, um, they didn't even make it into the town proper. Because of the risk they would face themselves if they tried to walk the remainder uh, alone. Even though we know what had happened. Reports were already coming in, but we just didn't, the, the people were like, we just didn't have the gumption to go forward to confirm it. Yeah. This is ridiculous. But. Yeah. We're, we're, we're doing pretty good so far. We're about halfway through the book. You can see the bookmark. Because right, I used my metal one. So, we're about... Not quite half, but almost. We're getting there. So, there's a lot more to tell of this story. Yeah. A massacre that never should have happened in the first place. But yeah. I'll go ahead and end this episode here. As always, educate thyself. Think, read, study, learn. Someone tries to tell you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. Uh, I thank you all for watching. I'll see you all in the next one. Until then, later.